Good, Sandra. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you to all of you who have uh, taken time out of your, uh, what I know are busy schedules to join us uh, on this magnificent Friday morning here in, uh, in San Diego. I hope it's an uh, equally magnificent day wherever you are, regardless of what the weather conditions are. I, I, as Sandra said, I am Desmond Wheatley. I'm the CEO uh, and actually the chairman of the board of uh, Beam Global, by far my favorite company uh, for so many different reasons. I feel very lucky and indeed honored to have this position to lead this, this company uh, and to lead this drive towards driving on sunshine. Uh, Sandra just made a couple of comments about last, this, this last year. It seems like only yesterday that I did this uh, last year around Earth Day. Uh, it's amazing how quickly the year has gone by, uh, but it's also been a pretty tough year on, on a lot of people, and we get that. And I think that's what really comes from this is it's been a year that has made it abundantly clear to all of us uh, that we need resiliency. Uh, we need to care about the environment around us. Things do go wrong, actually. We're not superheroes. Um, we need resiliency. We need American-made products. Uh, we need to make sure that we're, 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 we're self-sufficient in a lot of areas, particularly where fuel and energy is concerned, and, of course, some other important things as well. And that's really important to us here at Beam Global. We are an American company. As I often say, don't let my funny accent fool you. Uh, I'm a new American, uh, but this is a team of Americans in this building here who are producing the products that, that all of you are using. And then, of course, we've got some special guests today who aren't quite using them yet, but we hope to make you heroes by uh, this time next year. Uh, this is definitely about you, the heroes that are using the product. Um, and I just echo Sandra's comments. Uh, the fact that you continued at your posts and have continued to uh, improve your resiliency and reduce your fuel costs and do all the other magnificent things that you've done during this very, very difficult year. Uh, it's a real testament to your uh, stick to um, it, it's, it's an honor to do business with you. Um, so just a couple of things about what we're going we're, we're to go through here today. Um, in a minute, I'm going to just show you a couple of our older units. Um, but, but before I do that, I'll just tell you we're, we're going to talk talk out here for a couple of minutes this is unscripted uh, i am not a television presenter that's not one of my areas of expertise so i want you to be forgiving if you will uh, for the you know the, the lack of professionalism in video or in particularly in my presenting uh, uh one of our uh, uh, uh technicians actually is operating the camera here today it's not his full-time job operating a camera but i know robert's going to do a fantastic job so thank you for that robert um, and then we'll go inside and I'm going to take you through the, through the factory. As I say, this is unscripted. It's unrehearsed. Uh, you, what you see is what's going on uh, in there. All right. So things are changing all the time. I never quite know what's going to happen. One year when we did this, the guy running the camera nearly got run over by a truck that was delivering some steel here. So <laughs> just bear with us as we go through that process. Uh, I don't promise you perfection, uh, but I hope that at least you'll be uh, informed by what you see here. And then just one other thing to let you know, we're... Um, located in Miramar, just north of San Diego, um, about two miles as the crow flies, or rather as the F-18 flies in this direction here is the Miramar Marine Corps Air Station. And what that means is that from time to time, uh, all sorts of magnificent equipment flies overhead. Uh, we get F-18s, uh, 22s, even 35 sometimes, all kinds of rotor ring aircraft. Uh, and they make, it's not worth trying to compete with them on any level, right? Uh, they make an awful lot of noise. When that happens, which it inevitably will, uh, I'll probably just stop talking for a little minute. It might take 10 or 15 seconds for them to fly over at great speed. If you see me stop talking, you might hear a tremendous roaring sound in the background. You'll know that's because I can't hear myself think. We'll let them fly over, and then I'll come back to you. Do not adjust your television sets. It's just a, uh, uh, it's something that we, we can't avoid, and frankly, don't want to avoid it. They're magnificent pieces of kit, and uh, I think we're all very grateful to have them. So um, just... If, Robert, if you wouldn't mind just panning around here, before we go inside the building, behind me, by the way, the, that, this is our 52,000 square foot facility in San Diego. Uh, this is where we uh, do all of the intellectual property creation, all the engineering, uh, uh, invention of the products, take them through the patenting process, etc. And then also, and we're very proud of this, manufacture them here too. We don't send manufacturing overseas or side of the border or anywhere else like that. It actually happens right here in this 52,000 square foot facility. Any of you who are on the call that have or use EV arcs or have seen them, they were produced right here. Um, by a, a fantastic team of people, uh, veterans, uh, workers with disabilities, immigrants, God knows I'm one, uh, uh, really fine uh, contributors, a very, very diverse team, and I'm, I couldn't be more proud of them. Um, we, don't, we don't hire people because they're diverse. It's a meritocracy. We hire people because they are the best, but I do believe that we seek out merit in places that some others uh, you know, uh, perhaps ignore or overlook from time to time. Um, just a quick history tour here. There's a bit of a museum behind me, uh, you, what you're looking at, the two units that you can see uh, here behind me, I hope you can see them anyway, 
all the way over here, the red one. Oh, here come the Marines. Um, all the way up. <laughs> Jesus. Right on cue. If, in case you can still hear me, all the way over here, the red unit is unit 003 or 003. That's the third EV arc that we ever made. The reason that we still own it is because we kept it because we used it to do tours and to demonstrate the product. So it's got more air miles almost than I do. Um, I wish that was true, but anyway, close to it. Um, and it's had a hell of a thrashing in its life. But here's the crucial takeaway from that. That unit uh, was, was uh, deployed in 2012. So nine years ago, if my arithmetic is correct, no appreciable degradation in its performance during that period of time. So it's performing today just as well as it was performing back in 2012, nine years ago. And what that tells you is that the batteries, the solar modules, all the other componentry that we've got in there has survived uh, nine very rough years because it's been moved around a lot. Uh, EV arcs are, of course, transportable. They're designed to be moved around, but they're not designed to be moved around anywhere near as, this, as much as this one has. You know, God knows how many times it's been up and down the highway and everything else, and yet still operating with, as I say, no appreciable degradation in its performance. Now, fantastically, battery cells, solar modules and things like that have got a lot better during the last decade uh, since this thing was deployed. And so what we now know is that with the units that we've had deployed since 2012 still operating, uh, and again, without, depreciable, or without appreciable degradation of performance, a full decade of performance from the thing, and now we're deploying units that have far better uh, battery cells and solar modules and things like that too because the technology has advanced so much, particularly on the battery point of view. So we're very, very confident now uh, that the, the, the batteries and all these other things are going to perform well. The solar modules are warranted up to, uh, for 25 years, and we're even offering a 10-year warranty on the batteries as well. Um, so uh, that's a really good sign. Obviously, those are the things that people were most worried about at the beginning. Uh, Technology has come a long way. We're very confident because we've had all this field testing. And remember, we've got EV arcs deployed in over 100 jurisdictions across the United States, also in South America, in Europe, in Hawaii, and down in the Caribbean. Um, in the most varied circumstances you can imagine, we are in the hottest and dustiest and most inhospitable deserts in Nevada. We're in Buffalo, New York, where it snows like crazy with a lake effect snow. We're down in Florida, where we got hurricane conditions. Goodness knows we, our units survived 185 mile an hour category five winds in the Caribbean. We got a letter from our customer down there, the government of the US Virgin Islands telling us that our product was pretty much the only thing that survived, hurricanes Irma and Maria. It has to be said, we sell it with a 120 mile an hour stamped rating, but in fact, we know it survived these uh, hurricane force scales, 185 mile an hour winds. There were churches and buildings and things flying past it, uh, but it survived and continued operating during that time. So 10 years of operations in the harshest of environments across the United States, um, and again, no appreciable degradation in performance. So we're really happy about that. It's, only, it's a story that's only going to get better, but even the ones that we deployed 10 years ago are still, are still providing uh, a really faithful service. So that's 003. Um, product improved a lot. This one here is 007. No guesses for, I mean, no prizes for guessing why I felt I had to keep the unit number 007. Um, but uh, it, it, the product had changed quite a bit, but just in that, uh, th those few iterations there. Um, and on that, kind of interesting, you think you can see there's a Tesla there charging right now. Uh, Tesla is the only car brand that doesn't use the 1772 plug that all the other car brands do, but they sell you a little adapter, probably the most expensive piece of a wire you'll ever own. Um, and a Tesla part. And then right next to it, one of my uh, shameful secrets here, one of the three really stupid things I do in life is ride a, a motorcycle. And a very fast motorcycle it is too. All electric, made by a magnificent company called Zero, just south of Santa Cruz. And so it's waiting there. It'll charge as soon as we're finished charging that test. And we've got Chevrolet Bolt over there uh, charging uh, the, on 003. Again, the 10-year-old unit, the old lady, if you like, of the, of the, of the, of the fleet and yet still operating um, uh, just, just as she did when we first deployed her. We're, that's a great history lesson, but it's also a really strong endorsement for the value of the, of the product and its longevity. Um, and as I say, it, it's only better now uh, than it was then. Now, before I take you inside, um, let's just have a quick chat about what's going on here. We've got these two units deployed in parking lots, in these parking spaces. Both of them are two or 300 feet away from the nearest electrical connection. Uh, in order to deploy those, we would have had to trench two or 300 feet um, we're fortunate here. We have a lot of power on the property because, of course, we do a lot of manufacturing here. Uh, but lots of other properties might have to do power upgrades and all sorts of things, things you're very familiar with. Um, to just our ability to just drop these things and move them around is a key, a very important part of the product. 
product tracking. As you can see, the array is facing the sun using our patented tracking solution. That gives us about 25% more electricity than a fixed solar array would. We know that because we tested it, by the way. It's not theoretical. Um, and 25% more electricity means 25% more miles that you can drive thanks uh, to the, the power uh, delivered by one of these units. Um, and then all of that, of course, sitting on top of a column and probably the most important, the, the dumbest and the smartest part of the whole invention, the engineered ballast and traction pad, the thing the vehicle's parked on right there. It's that that gives us that, that stability that allows us to deploy these things without bolting them down, without gluing them down, without putting them in concrete. Uh, and yet they'll survive these ferocious wind conditions uh, without blowing away or, or falling over or anything else like that. And then, of course, very crucially, the vehicle's parking on it. So we're not losing the parking space. And that's a really important part of our patent. One of the many patents we have tied up in the product is our ability to deploy in a standard legal size parking space, but without uh, losing uh, that available parking space, because parking spaces are important. Otherwise, people wouldn't spend money on them. Uh, we don't want to uh, take one of them away. Just... Uh, to, last week, I was down in Kansas City. I think hopefully we got somebody from Kansas City on the line here. If you are, that, lovely to see you last week, uh, doing a ribbon cutting down there uh, in Olathe, where they've, where they've deployed EV arcs to charge their, their city vehicles and, and also for the public, actually. This was outside the library where we were. Week before that, I was in San Diego doing a press event with the mayor. Uh, San Diego is not a trivial city, a very large uh, city, uh, one of the top cities in the world, frankly. And yet the mayor came and did a press event, ribbon cutting and all that sort of stuff. And in that instance, we had two EV arcs there with five bolts plugged into each EV arc. So two EV arcs charging 10 bolts. Uh, San Diego fleet vehicles typically drive, I think they told me 23 miles per day or something. Plug five of them in and they'll all got what they need for their daily range replenishment. And I believe we may have somebody from San Diego on the line as well. So if you're there, hello, Colin. Nice to, uh, nice to have you on board with us and thank you very much. Um, the units, of course, are very good at charging electric vehicles, but because they're not connected to the grid, you never get a utility bill. And then crucially, they'll continue to charge during blackouts or brownouts. We know your fleet vehicles are important to you. And so it's really important that they continue to operate, even if there's a grid failure of any sort, like we saw in California last year, often see in New York, saw in Texas earlier on uh, this year, tragically. Uh, our products will continue to operate during those events and keep your vital fleet vehicles moving. That's a very important part. And then, of course, they've also got emergency power panels integrated into them. And I'll show you that on the inside. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because, Sandra, I'd like you to roll the video um, uh, showing what the city of Oakland did with their underutilized EV arc. So they had city of Oakland had these these units deployed outside offices of course during covid at the height of the pandemic last year people weren't going to the office and so those units were underutilized they weren't charging vehicles there but oakland clever buggers that they are picked them up and moved them to their covid emergency center and depleters that they've been relying on with the EVR. So they were able to charge electric vehicles at those locations and also able to power the entire COVID emergency test center off the emergency power panel uh, from the EVR, which of course is bloody helpful because now they don't have to run diesel generators. They don't have to fuel them. we got more Marines flying over at the moment, but they don't have to fuel the, the generators. Don't have to worry about them not starting. And they don't have to have this loud generator belching fumes into uh, an environment where people have respiratory uh, conditions. So, son, if you wouldn't mind, I'm, this is going to be a lot of I'm noise here. Right. Let's roll that video and then let me know when it's finished. Let me know when it's finished and, uh, and, and then we'll continue. Bill Smith. Happening today on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, the city of Oakland has moved one of its electric vehicle charging stations to provide EV charging and emergency power to a coronavirus testing facility. The chargers, made by Envision Solar, will provide power to the site without having to use a generator. Oakland usually has the units in locations where they could provide emergency power in case of grid failures. This is the first time that the EV chargers are being used to support COVID-19 related medical needs. COVID is a respiratory problem, so having generator fumes and that sort of stuff in a test center is hardly ideal. This is a great way for Oakland to have a clean and, re and renewable source of electricity, which is silent and emissions free. Envision Solar says it is working with other cities and corporate partners to do the same thing across the world, in fact. Um, new this morning, observing Earth Day, which is today uh, as the country battles the coronavirus pandemic. A short time ago here, the city of Oakland uh, relocated a solar-powered electric vehicle and disaster energy charging system. It was moved to a COVID-19 test site to energize electric cars and provide backup power for the facility. Oakland leaders say it's an example of the city's commitment to sustainability by using equipment for a number of purposes. 
This is a self-contained electric vehicle charging station, totally powered by solar. So it's green, sustainable, but most importantly, it's portable. And that's why we have it here at the test station today. These portable units fit inside a single parking spot. The technology allows the guidance system to follow the sun throughout the day. And the energy is stored in onboard batteries and then can be used at any time. All right, Desmond, back to you. Very good. Okay. Uh, just, just to check, are you seeing and hearing me okay, Sandra? Seeing and hearing you okay, I want to add thing, something for everyone. Um, there will be time at the end for a Q&A. So uh, enter your questions. If you move your cursor on your screen, you're going to see a little menu pop up. There's a, a bubble Q&A. You can enter your questions there, and we're going to have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So Desmond, go ahead and take it away. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks for running that video for everybody. Um, I know that some of you are very clever and observant people may have noticed that the newscasters referred often to Envision Solar. That was, of course, our name until about midway through last year when we did a rebranding to Beam Global. I'm really happy about that, that rebranding for uh, reasons which is better addressed on another call. But at any rate, it's a, it's a, that's why they were saying Envision Solar. We were Envision Solar for the first 10 years of our existence, and then we just rebranded to Beam Global. Nothing changed, just a better name and a better logo, if you ask me. Um, okay, uh, with all of that said, uh, just that video, just a fantastic illustration of the multiple layers of value. I mean, if you think about what, what's going on there, uh, single product used to charge electric vehicles, no utility bill, no construction, anything like that. And then uh, rather like Superman, during when the shit hits the fan into the phone booth, it goes, spins around and comes out. And now it's a disaster preparedness asset uh, powering COVID emergency centers all under the same uh, dollars with no, no increase in costs or anything else like that. So it's just a great way to get a whole lot of value. There simply isn't another EV charging solution out there that can, that can compete with that. And one thing that's crucial to point out, by the way, when I talk about EV charging solutions is you get the charger of your choice. You get the service provider of your choice. So if you're on ChargePoint or on Blink or Electrify America or use a Nell chargers or any quality brand of charger, that's what we're going to deliver factory integrated onto the EV arc there. We're not in that space. We're not competing with those companies. We're enabling them. We're supporting them. We're allowing you to have the charger of your choice and the service provider of your choice without construction, without electric work without utility bill, without risk from grid failures, um, and without all the other complexities and time-consuming stuff that's required to put a grid-tied charger in the ground. But don't think that you're stuck with a certain brand of charger by using us. You aren't. Tell us what you want, and that's what we're going to factory integrate. Um, if you're not sure, uh, then ask us. We've been doing this for 10 years. We've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and, and, and there are a wide variety of different chargers and business models out there. Some of them suit certain use cases very well. Some of them suit other use cases very well. We'll share with you what we've learned over the years. Uh, you, you, you're free to do with that information as you, as you wish. It's free. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly let you know what we've learned over the years and, and try to help you make the best decision for your charging requirements. Now, I'm just going to pop this thing on because although I'm inoculated and many of the people in our factory are, thank God for the vaccine, um, still not everybody is. And we're, 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 we've been very careful. We continued operating during the COVID crisis. We were deemed an emergency or, or, a, or a vital business very early on. Um, but back in March of 2020, we've never shut down. And I'm proud to say that we have not had a single infection to COVID uh, uh, from anybody that's come to work here. We had three employees who've had it. We were able to catch them really early on because we've done a great job of training everybody to look out for the signs. And we were able to stop them coming to work before they infected anybody else. So nobody has been infected here. We've been very, very strict. Face coverings, social distancing, hand washing, and, and all that sort of stuff. And although, as I say, I'm inoculated, uh, you know, to set the example from the top here, everyone has to wear these until everybody here is inoculated, which we hope will be in the next uh, a couple of weeks. So I'm going to chuck this thing on, uh, which will relieve you from my ugly mug as well. That's the limit. Uh, let's pop inside the building here. Uh, Robert, don't trip. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do is hurt, hurt Robert here because he's trying to look at a camera and walk through this, uh, this uh, facility here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through this piece uh, of the uh, factory, actually, because this is kind of the end of the story. And I'm going to take you to the beginning of the story. All right, John? Um, you're going to go to the beginning of the story here through this door. Um, because we do everything from soup to nuts here. Uh, as I said, these, the, this product is made here in this American factory. Uh, and 
it really starts with the raw materials. So come on through this door, Robert. You all right? Okay. Sandra, do you still hear me okay? Gotcha. Okay, good. All right, so here we are in the steel fabrication area here. Uh, this is where we bring in raw materials, steel, aluminum, and other, and other things. And then our team of welders and fitters and engineers and others actually convert the raw materials into the components uh, which end up making the EV arcs which are in your facility. Uh, we don't just make EV arcs here. Of course, we make our solar tree product as well, which is a large one for school buses or full-size buses and also all the way up to class eight vehicles. So if you're looking to charge buses or, or heavy goods vehicles, all the way up to class eight, we have an off-grid solar power product for that as well. Don't forget, we also do DC fast charging with the product. Um, and then also here, we're making these things too. This is the arc mobility trailer. Uh, so this is the thing that we use to move them around. I'll show you that in a minute. But in general, what you're seeing here is just uh, trained workers who are uh, producing the, 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 the product here that we got up there. And I'll tell you, we've had a lot of inspections here. Uh, we've had a lot of the, the welds and other things like that need to be non-destructively tested. And I can tell you that in every instance, uh, the, the inspectors that have come here told us the quality of welding, the quality of steel fabrication is absolutely at the top end of anything they see. So we're proud of that. It's very important to us. And we're going to keep it going. Let's have a wander over here. And I'll show you, you might remember the base pad that I described as the dumbest and the smartest part of the invention. Well, here's a couple of them right here. I'm standing on it. This thing here is the, as I say, the dumbest and smartest part of the invention. It's this that gives the unit its stability. It's engineered, it has a camber in it uh, for rigidity and for some other uh, reasons. And uh, this has all been, uh, there's a whole lot of bunch of stuff going on underneath here that you can't see. And then this is the column here, which is being set up, the curved column. Uh, they're, they're getting ready to weld that pedestal in place there. So uh, there's a couple of them in, in process, another one right there, and, and plenty more being built over there. Uh, so we, got a lot of, we can run a lot of product through here. Um, the team's getting faster and more efficient all the time, and we're constantly improving the factory environment, which increases our throughput, and at the same time improves quality and everything else. So just uh, lots of good stuff uh, going on there. Right. So that's what the, 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 this is where the steel fabrication gets done. Once the, once the steel fabrication is done, it goes away to get uh, um, abraded, sandblasted, shot blasted, and coated with marine grade uh, uh, coatings. Um, and then uh, when it comes back here, Robert, if you just follow me, um, when it comes back here, looks a bit like this actually. Here's what just happens to be one right here. So. Here's, the, here's that, I was just standing on that base pad earlier on. You'll notice it's no longer just mild steel. It's now co uh, covered in paint and also a non-skid sur non surface here uh, so that it's not slippery, obviously. And there's that column that I showed you that's uh, uh, back from paint. So this is waiting to have the array put on it. That horrible noise means everybody's going to lunch. These guys start very early here. Um, okay, so electronics in, uh, room here. Hi, guys, how are you doing? Glenn, Michael, thank you. Um, together the brains and the guts of the device in here. Um, there's a lot of computing and, and other things that goes on to manage the energy generation and storage. Uh, 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 and that gets put together in this clean room over here. And then once that's done, all of this stuff comes back over into this part here. It's actually good timing here because they're going to lunch. We won't disturb them. Um, and once it comes back into this uh, area here, what you can see is uh, one, two, three arrays being set up here. I'll just bring you over to this one here. This is, the, this is the array. This is the part that goes above the parking space, covered in solar modules here. And then underneath it, you can see all the brains and the guts and everything like that. A lot of computing, as I say, the energy storage, thermal management, uh, and, and a whole bunch of our intellectual property is going on inside that environment there so that we can turn sunlight into DC electricity store that DC electricity, and then make it useful to you through AC chargers, through AC uh, emergency panels, and a bunch of other stuff uh, too. Bridging through inclement weather events and allowing you to charge at nighttime and all that sort of stuff. So they set these up here. They, they build all of these out. And then you can see the crane, the overhead crane up here. We got uh, Navy, Marine Corps, United States, uh, Army, and uh, Air, For uh, Air Force up there because uh, we're We've got a lot, there's a lot of vets here and they're proud and they're right to be. Um, and uh, so they fly their flags from the, from the crane. Um, and then they bring them, they put it all together here. The arrays get brought over here with the crane. 
It's going to get set on top of this, uh, the column here and the tracking and everything's going on up there. And then once they're done, putting all together, they get folded down on themselves like this. You can see here. And this is so that they can be transported. Now, we've got these units going into 20-foot shipping containers. Uh, they go on the back of flatbed trucks. They get moved around with forklifts. Uh, but, of course, they also uh, are moved by our ARC mobility trailer, which I'm going to show you in a second. Just before I do that, let me show you this. I've uh, got one in, in progress here. So this thing here actually is the column for one of our solar tree products. This is the thing I was explaining to you that charges full-size buses and uh, all the way up to class eight vehicles. And so this is obviously, a, this is gonna be a lot larger than an EV arc. EV arc fits inside a single parking space. This thing's actually gonna cover uh, more like eight parking space, much larger array, still tracking, still following the sun using our patented tracking solution. In fact, all of the technology, the energy storage and everything is exactly the same as the EV arc. It's just a bigger format uh, for charging uh, more vehicles, of course. And as I mentioned, also performing DC fast charging. And then we're gonna do, all right, James, you all right? We're also going to do DC fast charging with the EV arc product. And in that case, what we do is we actually interconnect four of them together. Uh, it's all above ground, pre-engineered, so there's still no construction or electrical work. And then you get a DC fast charge, which is more like the gas station experience. Uh, although it has to be said, the great majority of charging that we do is uh, level two. That works really well. I've been driving an electric vehicle for 10 years. I can tell you what, the number of times I've needed to use DC fast charging, I can count them on the fingers of a couple of hands. Just when I'm doing long corridor type drives going up to San Francisco or something. The rest of the time, plugging into level two every day gives me everything that I, and actually much more than I, than I need. Um, okay, so that's what the units look like when they're kind of completed. And now we'll go out through, what happens is once they've been uh, set up there, they come into this area, this is called the chute. And in this area here, the engineers get back on them. Technicians are off them. Engineers are back on them. And what they're doing here is testing and configuring, making sure that everything's working. If there's something not right, we want to find it before it leaves the factory. Um, in most instances, we're successful with that. Whenever that happens, it's all logged and documented and we figure out what, what, how to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, we're not perfect. I, as I often say, we, you know, human beings have blown up two space shuttles. We try very hard to prevent that from happening. Anything made by human beings is gonna be prone to problems from time to time. The key thing is that we keep learning from it. We keep making the product better all the time and I can assure you uh, we do. Now, uh, once, it's, once it's come through here and it's been all tested, all that sort of stuff, this is perfect timing here. Um, here's one ready to go. Um, and what you can see is it's sitting on the art mobility trailer here. It's towed behind a, a, a you know, pretty, pretty standard pickup truck. Anyone who has the skill sets to park a boat trailer can deploy an EV arc. I, and by the way, I know that's not everybody, uh, but fortunately our people do and so do many of our customers. And so they, here it's sitting on this thing they call the art mobility trailer. Uh, this is a hydraulic system. What, you, what I'll show you here is, this is the base pad. Remember the thing I was talking to you about, the dumbest and smartest part of the, this thing that gives it all the, the uh, uh, stability. What's clever about what we do is instead of putting the thing on top of a trailer, we actually lift it up underneath the trailer. And so what that does is that allows us, once we get to the location, we don't need to load it off the trailer. We just lower it down onto the ground and then some hydraulics open it up and then we drive away from it. And this is one of the, the hooks on the hydraulic system that's holding it up here. This trailer is operated, it's got its own onboard hydraulic system and it's all charged by solar too. So it's, uh, it's uh, on its uh, own. This actually will go off to our customer we do also sell the trailer. So lots of our larger customers have the trailer as well as lots of units. And the reason they do that is because they want to be able to move them around uh, like Oakland did. Um, so customers like Google, New York City and others have the, the, the trailer as well. Um, very handy if you've got a fleet of EV arts because it's the best way to move them around by far. And then just over the other side there, sorry, Robert, I'm just gonna make you dizzy here. Uh, just over the other side there, you can see more units there with the columns lying on them getting ready to come in uh, to be to be filled out. We're basically just in time. Uh, we make the stuff as as it's ordered. Everything that you see here has got a home to go to. Um, and, you know, it's a great time to be doing what we're doing. It's a very busy time, uh, getting busier and busier. Um, but I like that. It's kind of like a restaurant. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when you, you go to a restaurant when it's quiet, it takes a long time to get your food and it's not very good. When it's really busy, you get your food faster and it's better. At least that's been my observation. Sort of like it is here. Um, I'm sort of... The, one other thing I always say, by the way, is never eat in a restaurant that's got a skinny chef because he's clearly not eating his own product. Um, I'm the fat chef of driving on sunshine. I've been doing it for 10 years now, and it works magnificently for me. Uh, two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, all the way up to 18 wheels. We're charging all of it. Even fixed wings. Uh, check out the, the video of our flying on sunshine test flight that we did last year. First ever 
world's first production aircraft powered entirely by locally generated and locally stored solar electricity. Uh, we, we, we came in on a motorcycle and a Tesla, unplugged the airplane, flew the airplane around, magnificent experience. I, I was lucky enough to be in it. Came back, landed the plane, got on the motorcycle and Tesla, which was fully charged, drove away on those and plugged the airplane in so it was charged for the next usage. So just incredible. Like I said, two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, 18 wheels, two wings. And then, of course, we've got a drone recharging product coming out as well. And actually, I shouldn't start with two wheels because we just got a photograph uh, last winter from somebody in New York City charging one of those one wheel things, you know, the one wheel skateboard things uh, by the Hudson, freezing cold, done up like, a, like you know, like someone in the Antarctic with their one wheel plugged into the into one of New York City's units on by the Hudson, which is that's the first time we've ever seen that usage. So it's not just two wheels. No, it's one wheel, two wheel, three wheels, four wheels, 18 wheels, whatever else uh, we can charge. So that's pretty much it for hey, the fact. Hey, Desmond, yes. what, since yeah. you're right by the solar tree, you want to point that out? Yes, I, we, I already did. I already described it. Oh, okay. This is the, col right. the column for the solar tree for doing your full-size vehicles or your Class 8. Um, and again, it's going to have the tracking on top of it. It's going to have the array with all the, with all the, the, uh, the solar modules on it. One other crucial thing to point out here, and most of you will know this, but um, the units that I showed you outside, the equipment was in an enclosure on the ground. Um, and that, that's worked very well. As I say, we've had them operating for a decade now. And, and, but with a great innovation with the new 2020 year, which is this one, we've got that nice curved column and everything else. But all the equipment and storage is now up underneath the solar array. And what that does is it gets it off the ground. That makes more parking space available. That's one of the reasons we've got the curved column now. So with the park, we made more parking space available to you, not just for compact cars now. Full-size cars can park in there. And then curved column, we think, looks nicer. And then all that equipment and energy storage is up nine and a half feet above the ground. Well, that makes the product uh, flood proof to nine and a half feet. We can survive an inundation of nine and a half feet product. Uh, you might say, well, we're not going to use it when the flood waters are in it. And I don't blame you, although you might, because uh, the emergency power panel will still be available to you. Uh, but certainly when the waters recede, think about all the grid tied stuff. It's going to have to be ripped out, replaced, the conduits cleaned, all the mud and everything poured out of it. Our unit's ready to operate as soon as the waters recede. So another, just another great disaster preparedness thing. And then we like having all that equipment and everything up in the air too. It keeps it out of the way, out of reach of people. Um, I will say the one thing that we've observed, people often ask me about vandalism and stuff like that. And the truth is we haven't had any. Um, but the one thing that we have observed is that kids like to, to do what I believe is called an ollie uh, off their skateboard where they bump up in the air and then they can slide down the equipment enclosure. Well, you'd need to be a pretty bloody incredible skateboarder to do that now that the enclosure is uh, eight and a half feet up in there, nine and a half feet up in there. And, and furthermore, you have to be upside down while you were doing it as well. So I think we pretty much solved for that problem as well. Although I'm not certain I'm thrilled about that. I rather like kids riding skateboards. It's good for them. Better than playing on their bloody telephones. Okay, I think that's it for the, for the uh, uh, fabrication facility right now. Sandra, have I forgotten anything? I think you're good, Desmond. Take it upstairs. Okay, all right, good. All right, we're gonna pop upstairs now. I'm gonna show you the uh, office facility. By the way, just to, just to let you know, um, if any of you ever find yourself in the area, after all this nonsense is over, we're, we're really not bringing people into the building right now because of uh, the pandemic, but after all this is over, um, come and visit us. We'd love to have you. Um, if you want to see me, just let us know in advance because I do travel a lot, um, but we'd love to have you here, um, especially our heroes um, and anyone who's going to be one. Uh, so yeah, come and join us. We'll show you around in person. I'll give you a really bad cup of coffee because uh, we don't have very good coffee here. But anyway, um, all right, so here, this is the, uh, uh, you, you could call it the overhead part of the operation here in our facilities or our, our offices. Not all overhead though. So what we've got going on here is engineering here. Hello, Pat. Um, more engineering here. Hello, Brian. More engineering here. Hello, Anthony. Um, and then we've got operations going on here. Um, this is Catherine McDermott, are you in there? Yes, she is. This is our CFO, um, so finance. And then we've got Nick Trafford in here. Now, this chap's a very important person because I hope anyway, you'll all have to deal with him because he's the guy that sends out our bills, our invoices. <laughs> so with a bit of luck, you'll have to deal with him. All right, Nick. Um, down here, we've got sales, more sales. And then a, our, our fabulous palatial lunchroom here, uh, which I, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree is uh, very, very fancy. For some strange reason, there are two Scottish flags on the wall in this uh, room. I, I have no idea why that happened. Sheer coincidence. Probably here when we first took the building over and we just haven't taken them down. Uh, that's my guess anyway. And then uh, take bringing you down here and we'll take you into my 
palatial surrounding. More operations here. Just about to walk past Sandra's office. So here we've got service over here um, and uh, a conference room here. And then we'll do, Sandra's in there. Do you want to say hello, Sandra? There she is. Thanks for hosting. And then into my, yeah, I get the corner office here, right? One of the perks, one of the perks of the job. So yeah, Robert's going to put that down on the, on the table over there. And I'm going to, I'm going to, Robert, you're going to stay away from me because we're socially distanced. I'm going to take this thing off. Um, thank you for doing that. And Sandra, uh, I, I, incredibly, we still have 17 minutes left. Uh, so if you want to, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise we can give people some of their time back. Yeah, we have a few questions. I'm going to go close my door real quick because we can get an echo sometimes. Um, and just to we have some questions teed up, but if anybody has any to add, you can enter them in Q and A. And how you do that is you move your cursor. Whether you're on your phone, you can you can tap your phone. You can move the cursor on your desktop. A little menu will come up says Q and A. Type in your question. So the first question we've got here is. Uh, the base pad, the lip for cars to roll. What engineering went into this? What engineering went into this pad? This portion of the pad. We let's see. We like for easy roll on, easy roll on without having to step. Yes. Okay. You, so okay. So okay. So two. I think there are two questions there. Can you roll on and off the thing without having to stop and all that sort of stuff? And then the second one was what what, what engineering has gone into it. Uh, so I'll start with the second one first. Uh, from an engineering point of view, it's 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 obviously quite rigorous because it's very important. That's the thing that gives the whole thing stability. Um, remember, we've got this huge solar array up in the air. Well, it's not huge. I mean, it's inside the parking space, but it's large. It's like an aircraft wing. Put a lot of windage on it. Um, uh, you know, snow loading. Uh, if there's an earthquake, seismic activity, and all that sort of stuff. And really, that base pad is the thing that's that makes sure that that stays where it is. Make sure it doesn't fall over. Make sure it doesn't hurt anybody. Make sure it doesn't blow away in the wind. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, that base pad has managed to keep these things intact and in the same place down in the Caribbean, even during Category Five, 185 mile an hour winds. There's no accident there. So a great deal of time and energy has gone into not just the size and shape of the thing, well, particularly the shaping of it. Um, and then what's going on underneath that in terms of making that rigid, uh, it's a, just a very important part of the, the makeup. So what we do is we do all the analysis here ourselves. Those engineers that I showed you, they're doing all of that, computer modeling it and everything else. And then when we're comfortable with it, we send it out to a third party. And what they do is they use uh, CBC and IBC or whatever it is, and they run all their calculations on it. And they're incredibly risk averse. Uh, believe me, they, they're, they're not edge case people here. So they're using safety factors, something like 2.4 to 1 or whatever. They do all their analysis on it and then they come back and they stamp it. So what you've got is our trained engineers who are arguably the world's preeminent experts have been doing this for a decade and then doing all of their work and then sending out someone who's completely independent and who has to worry about their own license and registry and, and, and reputation, everything like that. They do their independent calculations and then they tell us, yes, we approve this and we get a stamp on it. So fear not. It's been through a rigorous engineering process, both internally and externally, and passed with flying colors. And then beyond that, it's passed with flying colors in the field in the most rigorous uh, conditions you can imagine. We've got EBRs, by the way, deployed not just on blacktop and concrete, but we've also got them deployed on gravel, on sand, and even on grass. Uh, in fact, the ones in the Caribbean were deployed on grass. And the reason we're able to do that is because although the EVR is really heavy, and it needs to be, and almost all of that weight is in the base pad, that's what, that's what gives it its stability. Um, even though it's really heavy, it actually exerts less pounds per square inch than I am right now. Uh, just my weight, uh, and I'm fairly trim, at least I like to think so anyway, just my weight on my feet here, alone exerting more pounds per square inch than an EV arc is, even though the EV arc weighs far more than I do. And that's because we're dispersing that load uh, out through that uh, base pad, which measures 18 feet by seven and a half feet, gives us an awful lot of square inches to put the weight into. And, 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 and uh, that, that means pounds per square inch are a lot less even than just me standing here. And that's cool because that means we can deploy it on top decks of parking structures and stuff like that. And in these other types of environments without, uh, without worrying about it. Um, now you asked about roll on, roll off. Uh, so the base pad, um, I, I would say the, 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 the most equivalent experience that you would get in normal life would be like driving over a piece of trench plate. It's not that you're not going to notice it. You will notice it. You're going to, doom, you're going to feel a little doom. It's certainly less than a speed bump, um, but it's probably a bit like driving over a piece of trench plate. Uh, you certainly don't have to stop. Um, I, we do see that careful drivers, when they first get these, they're a little bit nervous getting onto it and all that sort of stuff, but they don't need to be. 
Um, it's, as I say, very like driving on a piece of trench plate and, and certainly a lot less impactful than driving over a speed bump. And the truth is, we don't really want you doing 70 miles an hour when you drive into a parking space. Uh, we're sort of hopeful that you're uh, driving in a, in a more, uh, uh, let's say, refined manner than that. Um, although it might be fun to try it, but not with a fleet vehicle or uh, not in a working environment. Um, so slowing people down a little bit as they pull in is probably not the worst thing anyway. Great, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, I've got a bunch more coming in. Thanks, folks. So uh, here's another question. We, our EV arcs are the original model, like the ones in your parking lot. Is the new model very different in terms of how it functions from the older model? Um, so thank you very much, by the way, first of all. Uh, the, your, your, frankly, it's likely that your models are a little bit more advanced than the ones that are in the parking lot because we did make some really dramatic changes at, uh, early on in the, in, the, in the beginning. So unless you got them back in sort of 2012 or 2013, they're likely a slightly later generation. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, we, you're, you're getting great service out of them. Um, the new, the 2020 model is different in several ways. Um, certainly the, the curved column opens up a little bit more parking space, which we like. Um, most people like that too. And then moving the equipment up under the array uh, definitely also helps from that flood proofing point of view. If you're in that kind of a flood point and some weird places are, I mean, I just discovered the other day, Sacramento, for example, is one of the, that, that's in a, a highly flood prone environment because it's only just above sea level. So lots of places are flood prone. Um, and moving the equipment up there helps with that. Of course, if you've got an earlier EV arc that, and, and you're worried about flooding, you can pick them up. You can pick them up and put them onto something or you can pick them up and move them to higher elevation because generally you know flooding's coming. It doesn't usually happen as a surprise unless you're sort of in, the, you know, in one of those canyons in Utah or something like that, which is not really a typical EV arc location. But at any rate, if you think there's flooding coming, you can pick them up. But so that would be one of the crucial differences. Equipment's up in the air, curved column, you've got more, more parking space and all that sort of stuff. And the truth is there is more power coming out of them, more energy coming out of them right now. We just announced a couple of months ago that we've just we managed to squeeze another 12% of energy out of them. That means 12% more miles you can drive with the units. And that's because our engineers just never stop trying to figure out ways to make them more efficient and squeeze more stuff out of them. But also because the solar modules that we're integrating and the battery cells are getting better all the time. That's, that's kind of out of our control, but it's a benefit that we, with the product benefits from it, uh, it, it uh, without us necessarily being involved in that process. So they're going to keep getting better. Uh, that's the thing about technology, right? Every laptop you own is a little bit better than the last one they had. It doesn't mean that the last one they had was, was sucks or that you shouldn't have owned it, uh, it uh, but it just it, inevitably it's going to get better. So what I would say is get keep using your units. They've got many, many years of life in them, uh, probably a 20 year product. Um, and then if you need more, we'll ship you the 2020 units and you can put them. If there's a, if you, if you have a, an older unit that's somewhere that's prone to flooding, let's pick it up. Let's move it to our elevation. Let's put the 2020 into the flooding prone uh, environment um, and just get more and more miles out of it. Look, here's the, here's the crucial thing to know. The grid, the U.S. grid, does not have enough capacity to support the electrical electrification of transportation anyway, right? Uh, Elon Musk just recently said it's going to require a doubling of capacity on the grid. There are some other experts who say three or four times, even five times the capacity we have right now. My own calculations show a minimum of 1.5 to 1.6 times what we have today if everything was perfect, which of course nothing is. Um, so we're clearly going to need an awful lot more off-grid, locally generated, locally stored charging infrastructure. And that's a U.S. scale. And by the way, global grid doesn't have enough for for, for, for charge for electrification either. Uh, but also down locally, even on your own property, uh, you might be able to install a couple of grid tied chargers and then you run out of available circuit and then it's really expensive to upgrade, add more EV arcs that will solve that problem. Or in your neighborhood at the substation level, uh, the, you start to run out of capacity. It's very expensive to upgrade substation add more EV arcs, and then you'll get what you need. So um, enjoy the, the ones that you have. Keep using them. Uh, keep in touch with us. Let us know how you're doing. We'll, 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 we'll do whatever we need to do to, to make sure you get good and useful enjoyment out of them. Um, and then if you need more, we'll send you the 2020s, and you can use them appropriately as well. Great. Um, another question. Does the stow kit also charge the EV arc while being transported? Uh, good question. So the EV arcs leave the factory with the, with the batteries full. So they're ready to, if we deliver them in the middle of the night, and we very often do, they're ready to operate the minute you get them. Uh, the stoker itself doesn't charge them, but uh, at, because they leave full, there's no real reason for them to charge during transport. Because if, if you think about it, what's happening is the solar resource is coming onto the unit. If the batteries are already full, it's like a bucket 
once the bucket's full of water, you got a hose pipe running into it, which is the solar putting electricity in, like kind of like a hose pipe of water into a bucket. It just overflows anyway. Um, as long as we deliver them to you with full batteries, you've got everything you need. Of course, as soon as the sun comes up the next morning, if you're charging, it will start to replenish uh, those batteries. Great. Uh, let's see, where are the solar panels manufactured? That's an excellent question. So we buy our panels from an American company, SunPower. The reason we buy those product, those panels is because they are the most energy dense and most expensive modules that we can buy uh, for a bankable product. Um, mean, in other words, meaning one that's mass produced and reliable and warranted. And everything. There are some other edge case technologies coming out. We're always watching that, but none of them are anything that we can feel confident will give us that 25 year warranty and, and, and everything else that you want. It's an American company, but it has to be said like everything. And, and listen, I, I wish it was different. You can see we run a manufacturing facility here. We have we have we have avoided the temptation to near shore move across into Mexico or, or even go to Asia. We're determined to demonstrate that we can manufacture these products produce a quality product with a great American team right here in America. But look, folks, the fact is the components from them coming from all over the world. Um, we, we do everything that we can to source only American products and we qualify for the for buy, buy American products because much more than 50% of the cost of the product, which is the qualifier, is, is born in the United States. Um, but the modules themselves, although we're buying from an American company, uh, they're manufactured in Mexico and in the Philippines. And sometimes that moves around a little bit. Um, but uh, hey, there are other components too. The gears, for example, we just cannot buy them in America. Nobody makes them. This is the gears for the tracking. You can buy them in China or you can buy them in Germany. The German gears are much more expensive than the Chinese gears. We buy the German gears uh, because we, we couldn't break them. They're, they're, I mean, they're pretty much indestructible. Uh, whereas I'm sad to report we were actually um, able to break the, the Chinese gears that we bought to test. And so this is a, actually a really good uh, point to explain to you that all of the components that we put into the product, the best solar models we can get, the best battery uh, cells that we can get, the best gearing that we can get, the best models. We don't scrimp or, or try and save money in any area. And that drives our costs up a little bit. Um, but we believe that producing a quality product that will give you many, many years of, of, of service without undue numbers of failures is more important than trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, scrub costs out by inferior quality products. We just don't do it. Um, and we can demonstrate that across the board, by the way. Uh, if you've got specific direct questions, like the one you just asked about the modules, feel free to drop us a line and ask us, and we'll tell you exactly where the component tree is coming from. And we'll demonstrate to you that we've sourced the highest quality that we can find. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, how much charging can you get from an ARC 2020 outfitted for DC fast charging? Right. So, so DC fast charging, again, remember, we're accomplishing that by integrating four EV Arc 2020s together. Uh, so we're deployed these for Caltrans and rest areas in California, for example. Uh, works really well. EV Arc, miss a space. EV Arc, miss a space. EV Arc, miss a space. EV Arc, and so on. And then we interconnect them with a pre-engineered above ground uh, interconnection. So we don't need to do any drenching or any construction or electrical work or anything else like that. Now, that setup um, there's a lot more storage and a lot more electronics and a lot more other things in there. That setup is going to provide more than a thousand miles of charging through that DC fast charger in a day. Now, obviously, that's going to be impacted by weather conditions and all that sort of stuff. But that's a that's a good sort of nameplate uh, for you there. And that turns out to be a really useful amount, actually, in a rest area or something like that. Somebody comes in, they're dwelling there for half an hour or an hour. They're picking up, you know. 75, 100 miles or whatever, that gets them down to the next place they're going. And you can cycle an awful lot of vehicles across that uh, on a daily basis. And of course, it, once, once, once that's used up, just add some more. You, don't, you still don't need to do any more trenching. You don't need to do any grid upgrades or anything else like that. One other thing that's really important to mention here is that all of our products are grid connectable. They're all capable of taking an input from the grid and putting energy back onto the grid. Most of the time, it's not a good idea because that requires the trenching and the electrical work and all the other stuff to get that connection there. But I will say this to you, some of our customers that are not fortunate enough to be in the kind of climate that we're in, uh, you know, places in Pennsylvania and that sort of stuff where they get literally weeks of black skies, they can run a 120 volt circuit to the unit. Uh, in fact, you can use an extension cord. You can just plug it in with an extension cord. And what that will do with that 120 volt circuit, which is kind of widely available even in parking lots, the 240 volt circuit you need for EV charging isn't there, but the 120 volt circuit often is. You run an extension cord and then that will trickle charge the batteries 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's augmented by the solar that we get even when it's cloudy or when the sun peeks through the, the skies. And this kind of allows you to keep that level two charge operating with a very inexpensive 
uh, you know, if it's an extension cord, zero type of uh, zero uh, construction or electrical work type of job, just to trickle charge the batteries like you would charge anything else. So it's another benefit that comes off the product. In fact, some a couple of our utility customers have connected them to the grid for grid balancing. So they can take power out of our batteries when the grid comes under stress, put power back into the batteries when there's a surplus of, of, of energy. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds there. All the charging and everything's happening from solar, uh, but you've got this grid connection uh, you know, as well to augment that. So that's another thing to, you know, it's another option to think about, particularly if you're in a really cloudy, bad weather type of environment, but you still want to take advantage of the, the benefits of the product. Uh, you can grid connect them and trickle charge them with a, a really inexpensive electricity and really inexpensive uh, grid connection. The electricity is cheaper because you're not taking big, big gulps of it. You're just trickling it in there. And of course, there's very little or sometimes no work to, to do that connection. And for the DC fast charging, in cases where we expect there to be high usage like that, connecting a small circuit to the, to the, to the unit is very inexpensive, not disruptive. In a rest area, for example, that has enough circuits for lights, you know, hand dryers, and maybe a vending machine, but not enough to provide that really high power circuit, you can put a small circuit into the EVR, trickle charging 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then our units are like circuit multipliers, they'll boost that up to that 50 kilowatt fast DC fast charge, just like a gas station experience. And that's another great, another great way of, of you know, solving that problem because it's really expensive to take big circuits to uh, uh, remotely, pretty expensive to take them just across the parking lot, but it's very expensive to take them to remote locations. You got to do all kinds of upgrades, transformers, switch gears, and everything else like that. We solve all those problems. Great, great, thank you. We, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna to try to condense the three separate questions on the ARC Mobility trailer, but I'm gonna condense it, and this will be our last question. There are still some others in here, but what I'll do is I'll make sure we follow up with you and answer those um, directly. So the last question, I'm kind of consolidating several about the ARC Mobility trailer. Someone pointed out they don't see it on the website. Uh, they're happy to hear that it's available, so it's available to order. The answer to that is yes. But one of the questions, um, uh, Desmond, if you could elaborate on is, if, I, if someone has the original model and the new EVARC 2020s in their, in their uh, fleet of EVARCs, how would they use the ARC Mobility trailer? Do they need two separate trailers? No, the, the new ARC Mobility trailer, the one that I showed you outside, will pick up an old unit. Um, so that's the, that, that, that's the, the, uh, the answer to that. Um, so, and that's a very good question and one that we spent a great deal of, uh, of time thinking about. Um, so yes, you can pick up the, the, your old, if you, so, so now if you, if you bought EVR 2020s and you want an art mobility trailer, the art mobility trailer that we send you will pick up the, the, uh, the, the, the former units as, as well and you can move them around with that. Okay, good. And, and just to, um, to let folks know, yes, the art mobility trailers are available to order. So um, your salesperson, I know all of, I see people who've worked with Matt Miller, Andy Ike, I see some of Brian's customers here, uh, Matt Bianco. So we're, we're happy to help you out with that. Those are available. It's not on the website. Yes, I own marketing. It's not on the website yet because we haven't officially launched it. You'll see that official launch coming up, but it is available to order. And we are, Desmond, we just did our first three off the line. Is that right? Yeah, I, and I, they're, they're a tremendous improvement over the previous ones. I mean, uh, uh, that, that's part of the reason they're not on the website yet. We've, we've really put a lot into this new model. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's marching forward. Listen, we, we think there's a future where uh, the Art Mobility trailer will deploy itself. Uh, it, and, and, of course, there's a future where it will drive itself to your site. We're not there yet. But autonomous vehicles are coming, autonomous uh, deployments are coming, and that's in our future. We will, at, at some point, you'll order an EVR and it'll be delivered to your site by an art mobility trailer that doesn't have a driver. Um, I, I don't have any doubt in my mind that that will happen. I don't know when that's going to happen, but it's a, it's, it's a when, it's not an if. It will happen at some point in the future. In the meantime, we just keep making them better, uh, easier to use and safer and everything else like that. And I, I, look, like any other technology uh, advancement, we've had, we had some teething problems with it. I mean, the, the first one that we produced, I should have showed you. In fact, I think it's still here. It does not even paint it. We didn't even paint it because we knew we were going to make changes to it. And so it looks like it's horrible. You know, it's an ugly, rusty old thing like that. I mean, it's superficial rust, um, not structural rust, but superficially rusty. And that was because we knew we were going to make a lot of changes to it. Now we've got the thing dialed into where a single operator can use it very efficiently, very safely. Um, and that's why we're just now at the point where we can start delivering them to, 
to customers. Um, we had the old one dialed in and that was working really well for the, for the old model, but this new one wasn't so dialed in. So we've had a gap between our, our ability to deliver the old one, which was well dialed in, and then this new one, which until now has gone through this development process. Good news is we do all that development process ourselves. We put ourselves through the pain and suffering as it were, um, and we don't deliver it to you until we're very confident that it's, uh, it's ready to operate you know, in a safe and, and really easy and efficient manner. Great. Well, we're a little bit over, so let's wrap it up. I know, Desmond, you have a, an 11 o'clock to jump to also. So yes. um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Listen, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, thanks for being customers. We're, 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 as I said, we're an American company. We're working very hard to produce products in this country. Uh, we're, we believe we're the future of fuel. We care about energy security. We care about the environment. We care about putting good people to work and giving them quality long-term jobs. We couldn't do it without you, the customers. Uh, we want your feedback. We want to hear everything you have to say about the product, good, bad, and, 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 and ugly, frankly, whatever it is. We listen to you, actually. The lots of things that are in the 2020 have come about as a result of the comments, the feedback that we've got back from our existing customers. So please keep that coming to us. Let us know what you want. Let us know what we can do better. Um, Bear with us. We are on a growth curve. Uh, you know, we're, we're, if, if you're not getting the attention that you hope to get or something like that, just keep, you know, get back in touch with us because it's, that's all it is. Um, it's a, everybody's working very, very hard here to, to, to create a great future. We really appreciate your involvement. And as I say to our heroes, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's fantastic what you've done during this last uh, very taxing year and what you're going to be doing for many years moving forward. And to those of you who are not heroes yet, I can't wait to send a certificate to you next year. So thanks very much. All the best. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay safe and uh, have a magnificent weekend.